Hi everybody, thanks for joining me this morning, or this afternoon I guess it is for me, morning for a lot of you. Um, we're going to cover an awful lot today. We're going to talk about working with backgrounds, doing some really cool things with backgrounds, and we're going to paint some pretty white orchids, and I'm going to show you some neat stenciling techniques for doing all kinds of really cool things for dimensional items, and uh, we also have to talk about the winners from last week's live. So, uh, we shipped off goodies today to uh, three lovely stencil winners, Janine Osborne, Peggy Blazer, and Sandy Kelsey. You should receive those in about seven to ten days. You should have some goodies in the mail. And the uh, brush set and the dauber set went to Bernice Alvera. Congratulations, ladies. Thank you for joining me on Saturdays for these lives. We have a lot to cover today. Um, and a lot of the product that we're using is that from the Decor Media, also from the Decor Americana. And we're using brushes from Dynasty. We're using the Dynasty Faux Squirrel, as well as the stencil brushes, the Stencil Pro. And we're using some stamps from stampendus.com and the surface you can get at Michael's Crafts. It's a simple 8x10 uh, wood panel or an 8x10 canvas. Perfect. And uh, we have a couple of stencils in there from tracymoreau.net, of course. Um, we do have a giveaway this week, too, and quite a nice one. We have a gorgeous set of round brushes in the Dynasty Faux Squirrel. Let me show you those. They're beautiful. Gorgeous set of rounds. Now, these are the nice big rounds, so you can play with these with your watercolor. They're fantastic. And we have two gorgeous stamp sets from Stampendous. So we have... Two winners are going to get this gorgeous paisley set. Um, beautiful for doing backgrounds. You're going to love those. So it would be two winners for those as well. So we have lots of goodies to give away. So if you're ready to get started, so am I. So we'll pan down. I think we're going to pan down. Oh, there we are. We're down. <laughs> okay. So this is the piece we're going to work on today, and it is multiple layers. So to create this background, it's actually very simple. It's just a little bit time consuming. You need to do a few things to, to get from point A to point B. So we're going to start with the basics. The background is simply base coated with lamp black. Just any shade of lamp black it can be Americana, it can be um, folk art, just a nice solid black with a matte finish. That's all you really need to get this base down. I mix mine with a little bit of matte medium or all-purpose sealer uh, to get a nice smooth surface because that's important when you're doing this particular technique. So it gives you a nice tight and I sand in between coats. So two to three coats of lamp black gives you a nice solid base coat to work this background. So from there we need to do the first step which is to get that lettering, this large portion in the background here. We need to get that in place. And this is how that's done. Inside the pattern is this line drawing. Now, essentially, you could put this dead square in the middle, or you could put it up at the top, or you could put it down the bottom. I find that it's more effective if it is not centered and it goes off the page. It gives the background some continuity. It gives it the impression that whatever is inside this 8 by 10 space continues elsewhere. And it makes it more interesting than just having it plopped in the middle. So you can choose where to put it, whether it's in the, towards the center or down at the bottom or further up to the top. Just don't make it perfect in the middle. Just take it off the page. So what I did was simply kind of center it slightly off above and below and I taped it into place and I place white graphite underneath this and then I get out my little steel ruler and all of those vertical lines on these big M's get a vertical line just like that. Now the reason I do this is to give all of those letters, those most important vertical and horizontal lines, they have to be straight. If they're not straight, then the eye will pick up on it and it looks wonky. When you're painting lettering like this, if your lines are nice and straight, you're going to get nice straight lettering. 
if the lines are wonky, you're never going to get straight lettering. So nice, straight, vertical and horizontal lines. All those curves can disguise little errors, but those vertical and horizontal lines will give you away every single time. And a straight edge steel ruler is ideal because that clean edge will stay clean. If you use a plastic ruler or a wooden one, they have a tendency to get marred over time and then you never get a crisp line. So a good quality steel ruler is an ideal thing to have in your paint box if you're going to be doing lettering. So once you have your vertical and horizontal lines in place, all those curved lines can be connected. You can just freehand those in because these ones are going to be a little more forgiving than those nice straight lines. So once you have all of your lettering traced, you're going to fill it in with warm white. Now I use my favorite brush, my rigger, either a number two or a four, whatever you're most comfortable with, but this is what I paint all of these lines in with. You need your white paint to be about milk thin. For this background, we do not need them to be perfect. It does not need to be fully opaque. And the reason for that is that we're going to distress this anyhow, so we don't really need to have it absolutely perfect. But it does need to be clean and clear. So once you've done that, take out an eraser and clear away all of your white graphite lines just to clean it up so that they're nice and smooth. Just like that. I like these Factus black erasers for working on black backgrounds because they don't smudge whatever it is you're erasing. They give you a nice clean finish and they clean up those backgrounds really, really nicely. It also doesn't leave shiny marks on a black background either. So there we have it. We have lettering in place and we have our nice matte back black background. So we have to do a simple step in here. We're going to use a stamp to create some visual texture in the background. And to ink up that stamp, we're going to use one of these. This is a brayer. It's a small one. They're available at Hobby Lobby or at Michaels. Most craft stores will carry them. You'll usually find them in the mixed media section with the Tim Holtz supplies. This is in fact, this is a Tim Holtz brayer, this little one. These are fantastic, especially if you're going to be loading paint onto a stamp. So I simply load up that brayer by rolling it through some white paint. I gotta move this out of the way. And then you just take that roller, that brayer, and you roll over your stamp. Now I'm just using ordinary Americana paint. There's nothing fancy here. So then once your stamp is loaded, you take it to your surface and you're going to stamp it in place, but I'm not really worried about whether or not it's perfect. And it's fairly random. I'm not, no structure here. I just want to create a little bit of interest in the background. I don't care if it's perfect. Let's get a little bit more on. And I've got this area down here I want to add a little bit to. There we go. So some of it is nice and clear, some of it is very indistinct, but none of it, none of it is perfect. So now we have that in place, and that was simple. So to clean the stamp, just a little bit of warm water right away will take care of that. If you don't have time right away to clean it, then uh, quickly wipe it down with a baby wipe. That will work well too. And if you forget and don't clean your stamp, then take a little bit of rubbing alcohol and a soft cloth and wipe it over that, and that will take care of it. So stamping. So we've done two things. We've created this lettering in the background and we've stamped something finer and less distinct in here. So now we have to add a stencil to this. Now the stencil that I chose was this one. This is a postage stencil. And the color I wanted for this, um, you can do it in white or you can do it in gold. I rather like the gold. I like the way it looks 
when it's on this and it gives you a change in the overall appearance. There's a little bit of bling in it. So we need a little bit of gold paint and my Dynasty Stencil Pro stencil brush. And I'm picking up just a small amount of that gold paint. I don't want a ton in the brush. And I have to choose where I'm going to place it. So I like one down at the bottom because I know that I've got a vase that's going to be in this corner and I kind of like having it peek around it. So I'm going to stencil with the gold, work the brush in a circular fashion, and change directions frequently. Now the reason I do that is if you work in one direction constantly, what happens is the paint builds up on one side of the stencil and then it ends up breaching and you don't get a clean stenciled image. So you get paint sliding underneath the stencil. If you change directions, it gives you a more even distribution of paint and then you get a nice clean image. So I'm going to pop one more up here in the upper right corner. And I'm going to take this one off the page a little bit just for the sake of interest. And I'm going to do the same thing circular fashion and change directions frequently. You don't need a ton of paint. You don't even want it fully opaque. It's much more interesting if it's not. There we go. So we have three layers on this so far. And it looks very bright white, very bright white, and then this bright shiny gold. So we need to subdue this a little bit so that it doesn't compete with the image in the end. So we need to get this paint to dry. I'm going to make a little bit of noise here. Okay. There. Dry enough. Let's see. Who's on? Who joined us today? I can't get this thing to scroll. Here we go. Oh, Deb. Happy Saturday, Deb. <laughs> hey, Sandy. Hey, sweetie. Thanks for coming. Oh, my goodness. Diane Blay. Thank you, honey. How are things in Ottawa? Are they wet or just hot? And Rosie. Hi, Rosie. And Debbie. Oh, my goodness. Everybody's on here. Deborah Cole. Nice to see you, too. And Kathy Murphy. Oh my heavens, Sue Potts, lovey. Nice to see you. Good heavens. Everybody's on here today. Don't forget to like and share this video um, because that's going to get you entered in that giveaway. And we've got some nice uh, stamp sets from Stampendous and we have a gorgeous set of big juicy round brushes from Dynasty and the Faux Squirrel. So don't forget to like and share this video. There's my girl Sheila. <laughs> Thanks for joining me. Okay, so we have, this paint is now dry. So that's, so far this was a pretty straightforward, pretty simple method. So the next thing we're going to do is subdue this a little bit. And this part usually scares people because the color I use is asphaltum. And it looks like a really dark brown in the <laughs> in the bottle but honestly it's more of a yellow it's got a yellow hue to it so I'm going to take my my fugly brush this is one of my favorites this is a dynasty encaustic brush and it is it's fugly it's loaded with paint you can tell I love this brush um, I use this a lot for this type of thing because I like the texture of it it's a it's a really nice brush to work with so we're going to get messy. You know, um, my mom used to tell us that if you didn't get dirty, you didn't have fun. Well, you're going to get dirty with this one. So I've thinned out some asphaltum. And I used a little bit of my Joe Sonia's fast drying glaze to do this. And we're going to bury this. This part's always scary, but it's a very juicy glazed. If you can see, it's not 
paint, it's more glaze-like, more liquid-like in this part. And it instantly knocks things back and subdues some of that lettering. So I brush that out. Now, if I leave it like this, you're going to see all of those vertical lines going up and down. And that's uh, not really a good thing. It can be a good thing, but in this case, I would rather it's not. So you're going to make, I call it a paper rose. Essentially, it's just some paper towel rolled up so that it forms sort of a little rosebud. And then you're going to just blot the surface with that rosebud. No, no swirling or rubbing, but just blot the surface a little bit and turn it. And it interrupts that glaze and creates an irregular look. Just like that. Which gives you a really interesting background. It means that some of these letter letters are going to be a little brighter in places and a little darker in others. And it gives a kind of a parchment appearance. Which brings me to something else about doing this type of background. I'm going to show you something. Of course, I put it just slightly out of reach. <laughs> so all of the technique that I used for creating this background is just simply a base coat, three design elements over top of it, and then a glaze coat over top of that. So that's done on black. This is exactly the same process done on buttermilk. I've used the asphaltum over top of this. I've stamped over top of this. I've done lettering. I've done uh, you know, a variety of, of techniques. All exactly the same as the black background, but gives you a completely different visual look. So you can take that same design, change up the base coat, and recreate the same technique, but gives you a completely different background. It's rich, it's elegant, and in this case, it almost looks like old paper or even old fabric. So it takes on more of a parchment look, not just because of the colors, but because of the technique for putting the background on. That's what gives you that great aged appearance. Pretty neat. So I'm going to set this one aside to dry and then we're going to talk about these flowers. How fun is that? So I have one here prepped. In this case I used white on the stencil but it's the same same techniques. So I'll set this aside to dry. So we have all of our flowers. I've base coated them in and I use warm white for this base coat. And you can tell that I don't really have, they're not opaque, they're not fully opaque. In some places you can even see the lettering through them. It's not really a big deal uh, because we're gonna create more texture on this and then you have to use some white to balance it out. So eventually we're going to have it completely covered. So I have a little bit of warm white on my palette let me explain how I base coat these surfaces. So these orchids, you'll notice that there's a gap between each of the segments. When I'm painting my pieces, I leave that gap so that I don't have to trace things on again. I really don't like tracing things three or four times. So I base coat in the shape of that petal. So I'll start from the center out like this so that it fills in that space in the shape of the petal, always following the shape of the petal. The reason I do this is just the nature of the paint will leave texture. And so you might as well make that texture work in your favor. So creating those lines and those stria that shape the petals and base coating this way will just save you some work on the other end. As simple as that. 
So I have a total of three coats of warm white on these orchids. Ordinarily, I would only give it two. It really doesn't need any more than that. But there we go. Now, if you have a look at these orchids in here, in all of these shading areas, they sort of take on a lavender appearance. There's a soft lavender hue to it. And it isn't achieved by using one color. We're actually using three colors to get there. So we're going to use um, cobalt teal hue, which is this gorgeous, luscious blue in the fluid acrylic. We're going to use primary magenta, which is the primary red. And we're going to use asphaltum. So between those three colors is how we're going to get this, this lovely lavender hue that's in these flowers. The fluid acrylics are transparent. They're very transparent. And so you have the ability to do some really gorgeous glazing technique and wash techniques using these while still being able to control the amount of color. So I dress my brush in my Joe Sonia's glaze, the fast drying glaze. I use that probably more than I use water when I'm painting. And the reason for it is, is that I can thin paint with it without compromising its ability to adhere to the surface. So I can make a very, very thin glaze. So just a touch of color. Just a touch of color on the brush and then blend it out as if you're going to float. So there should be very little color in that brush. And then you just lay in and float it into place. I don't worry about getting them utterly perfect. At this particular point, it's not really all that important. I'm not looking for a flawless float. We're just laying in color. So in all of those areas that are going to be shaded, you put a fine float of that cobalt teal hue. Just like that. The other nice thing is wherever you've blended for your float, that fast drying glaze will keep the paint wet for a while. So you can just go back to where you would in initially blend it and pick up a little more color. Just like that. That's it. And I'm going to do the same thing for all of these orchids. I'm just going to pull a little of that gorgeous, gorgeous cobalt teal hue. I love that blue. It's so pretty, so rich. Just like that. And it's a faint, faint blush of color. Need a little more on my brush here. Notice, typical, we're like, uh, decorative painters are like truck drivers. We're forever turning them, turning the piece. <laughs> so you can see I'm not fidgeting too much with with these floats. I'm not fussing with them. I don't need them to be perfect. It's just laying in a little color. The trick will just be in getting that control, learning the balance of getting that fluid acrylic nice and transparent with water or glaze so that you don't have really super strong shading in here. So put a little bit on here and there. Now I'm going to come down to these little buds here and do the same thing. I'm going to put just a wash of that blue. Again, neatness doesn't count. Perfection is to be avoided at all costs. Just like that. So we have all of our blue in place. All of those nice shadows. 
basically rinse out that brush. Now, as soon as this is dry, and it should dry fairly quickly, you're going to do the same thing with the primary magenta. Now, this color is super strong. It is a very strong red, so that make sure that you get that well blended so that you don't have a really potent punch of that pink because it is going to be pink and you're going to come in over top of that blue so what happens when you mix blue with red you get purple so this is the lean into our lavender tone that I was talking about earlier and it's just a blush of color And if you find it's too strong, just take a little baby wipe or a little piece of moist uh, paper towel and pull a little of it off because that color is strong, but it's going to look a little bit wonky and a little bit purpley for a while. <laughs> We're going to subdue it, so don't panic. We're going to put some asphaltum over top of this, so it's going to change it yet again. I'm going to pull it in here. That little blush of pink is just so pretty. And let's get some in here, wherever that blue is. So you're not completely covering all of the blue. We're just putting a little bit in in the darkest areas. And that's going to give us, again, that little lavender tint in those white orchids. They're coming together. And a little bit here. These are fun to paint and they're very forgiving because you can putz with them and fidget with them a little bit. I put a little, oops, how to paint back to that. There we go. There we go. So we're going to give this a second to dry. We've got our two shadings that cobalt teal and that primary magenta are on our petals so we give that a minute to dry so while we're waiting for that we're going to take that that rigor brush that we were using earlier for the lettering and get into a little of that green gold and you'll notice that i took the warm white and i base coated all of the vines and the tendrils and all parts of the flowers all with that warm white so all of these vines get painted in with that green gold, which is that this vibrant, almost olive green in the fluid acrylic. You can certainly paint this with regular Americanas. You could just simply convert the cobalt to you know, sea breeze or one of those brighter blues. And the primary magenta could be the cherry red. You could use it cherry red for it. And the green gold could be the olive green. This would be an, a very easy pattern to, to adapt to any color choice that you want, really. So there we go with that green in. This is not a difficult piece to paint. And you can have a lot of fun with it. Change it up, make the flowers bright pink instead of white. And, blue customize them any way you wanted to really especially with this black background using that black background is a nice neutral it'll carry almost any color choices that you make particularly colors with high saturation so bright reds and pinks and bright yellows look fantastic on black backgrounds so just about got all my vines done 
like I said, this piece does not take long to paint up. I have a neat little trick I'm going to show you for this vase, which we're going to get to next. So we have all the vines in. So all of this has to dry before we move on to the next stage. So I want to show you a really neat trick for filling in this vase, for painting this vase. So I'm going to put this one aside and come over here to this one so I can show you how this is done. So we're going to stencil onto this vase, 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 whatever you want to call it. We're going to stencil onto that vase. Now, I can see I've done it myself in the past. I can see some of you getting out the painter's tape and taping off this area on the stencil and then trying to hold it in place. Well, I have a really neat trick so that you don't have to do all of that. And it's this simple. I take my line drawing and I cut out the shape of the vase. And then I position the line drawing back onto the surface just like that, so that only the area that I need to stencil is showing. And then I take my stencil and I place that where I want it, and I tape that into place. And I put it in a couple of places. There's a reason for this. I don't want anything to move. So once that's in place and everything is firmly secured, you're going to load up your stencil brush with a little warm white blot on paper towel and then same thing that I always preach about hold you make sure your stencil is solid and then apply your color in a circular fashion and change directions frequently and this little trick will save you so much time touching up and fixing things so peel the tape off carefully remove your stencil and then carefully remove your line drawing. Voila. So this way all of your design element has the stencil pattern and nothing else. There's no cleaning up to do at edges. Everything is done nice and tight and exactly where you need it to be. Using that little masking technique where you cut away the shape with, of, from the original line drawing will save you so much time and energy and frustration, especially when you want to stencil into a very confined area without getting it onto your background. This is the technique you gotta use. It's so simple and it works every single time. <laughs> so come back to this because our paint is now dry. I'm going to tape my line drawing in place like so. And then I'm going to tape my stencil in place on mine here like this. Tape that in place and I'm going to stencil my vase. Change directions. There we go. Take the stencil off. And take the line drawing off. Bob's your uncle, Sally's your aunt. Look at that. Nice and tidy. I love it. Perfect. So while this is drying, we're going to work on the mouth of these flowers. I am using diarylite yellow, which is this very high saturated yellow. It's very bright. I love it. If you don't have the fluid acrylics and you wanted to use just your Americana, saffron yellow will work perfectly for this. Just need a really bright and in-your-face yellow. So it's in the center mouth of these little flowers. We're just going to tuck a light coat of that diarylite yellow in the center, like so. So now they're really in your face. 
Awesome. Stencils dry. So next, we have to start toning everything. Um, and one of the first things I want to do is finish off these um, these vines and tendrils. I'm picking up a little bit of sap green right here in the fluid acrylic. If you don't have the, the fluid acrylic, uh, then plantation pine will work perfectly or black green will work for fine too. So I'm just going to shade under the flowers with just a little float of that plantation or the sap green, sorry, just to separate those, lift them off the background. Again, I'm not really worried about getting it perfect. We're going to do some glazing over top of this. So there's a lot of things going to happen yet before we're finished. There we go. So I've got some sap green to shade that. We're going to do this again before all is said and done, but I just wanted to get a little bit in there first. So now it's time to start toning everything. Here comes that asphaltum, which is probably one of my favorite colors. Not probably, it's in everything I paint. <laughs> Absolutely everything I paint, I use asphaltum. <laughs> Anybody that paints my patterns knows that. So I've taken a, a little of that Joe Sonia's Fast Drying Glaze on my brush and a small amount of the asphaltum as well. And I'm going to thin it out. It needs to be almost not there. Like so. And out, I'm going to put a vein down the center of each of those petals. Oof. I think I have a little too much color in here. So I'm going to try that again. There we go. That's better. So I'm going to take that off. That one was a little too strong. There we go. Ooh. There, that's much better. Get a little bit of green drifted over. There we go. So that little bit of asphaltum over top of that lavender tones everything. Softens it up a little bit. Really not happy with that one. Where's my point blender? my point blender. I just get a little bit of water on my point blender and I can scrub out whenever I'm not pleased with something. A little bit of water or a little bit of fast drying glaze will take that right out. There we go. There we are. So back in with a little of that asphaltum. Let's see, who else is on here today? I can't get this thing to scroll. <laughs> I'm trying to get the laptop to do its thing and it's not wanting to. Nope, it's not working. <laughs> I wanted to see also who all was on here, but unfortunately I can't get the laptop won't scroll for some reason. So I'll just continue putting those shadows in the bottom over top of that lavender. I love how this looks. It just softens it, mutes it a little bit. There we go. What color am I using for which for the floating over top of this? This is thin dish faultum. If you if you're looking for it in the Americana line, the um, item number is DA one eight zero. Ash faultum. I use this color for everything. So okay. 
thin it a little bit more. So I'm just going to continue filling out and muting some of these shadows. I'm just going to finish off this one flower and then we'll move on to the next step. So whenever you're doing something like this, it's a good idea to balance things out so that they don't look so harsh. So I picked up a little bit of warm white on my brush and I'm just going to put a float of the warm white out to the edge. And if I work it back over where it meets the initial float of your other colors, it creates a muted edge. But it also keeps the edges of your flowers nice and clean. So I'm just floating a little warm white, like so, and along the bottom edge of these flowers, these petals here. Cleans up the edge, makes things nice and sharp on the outside edge of the flower, but it also helps you mute some of these and soften them. It gives those flowers that nice clean edge which is nice and bright against the black. And it also keeps things from getting a little too muddy or a little too harsh. So I'm going to just realize something. I'm going to pick up a little of that blue that we started with. I want to put a shadow here on that and do the same thing here it's a little strong but it's okay and right here I just want to create a crease in those petals Give it a second to dry and I'm going to put a little bit of the primary magenta over it. There we go. a little bit of that warm white on the highlight side will just make everything pop. Just like that. Easy peasy. So now all of these flowers get a little highlight opposite where I put the blues and the magenta and it's just a float of the warm white just to soften things up and to keep the flowers nice and bright they are white flowers so they should be predominantly showing the white so now now we're going to do that center in here I need a slightly smaller angle for that we're going to put a little bit of heat in the center of this flower. So I'm going to load up a little primary magenta onto a very small angle and I'm going to just float some in on one side of that yellow. Just like that. I don't want to put it everywhere but it does give the mouth of this a little bit of heat. Now the center of that flower is so simple to finish. It's this easy. It's just a comma stroke. You can use titanium white or you can use warm white. So I'm going to put a comma stroke of that titanium white on that side and a comma stroke of the titanium white on this side. It's that simple. That's the center of our flower.
And again, these comma strokes don't need to be perfect. Mine never are. Linda Sharp would nail them every time, but I don't. <laughs> It's just something to give it a little fold over at the mouth of the flower. So we'll put in a little comma stroke on each of these little buds as well. So I'm going to pull it down here so it's right there. And I pull the stroke up so that it comes along the edge of that flower. Like that. Now, we have a few highlights to put on those vines too, and I do that with a little bit of the warm white and a touch of that green gold. And it's going to make sort of a milky looking olivey color. It's also going to be the stems of our buds here. It's a little line of highlight on these vines flowers and it is just a little line on one side it doesn't have to be perfect and it is quite easy peasy so we've got our flower in we've got the vines done the highlight on the vines the buds are done let's shape this vase and this one is simple you need to have a sharp contrast between this vase and that background so we need to put just a little touch of um, cobalt or carbon black in that background and it's just to separate the vase from the background so it's going to be just a float this is carbon black or lamp black, and it's opposite that vase and on the background, just like that. And it's just going to separate this a little bit. So then, to shade the vase, we need a little float of asphaltum. This is one of my favorite colors for this. It's asphaltum. So nice dark float on the white area of the vase, like that. And then wash over all of the white area. Wherever that stencil is, wash over it with the asphaltum. Keep the darkest value to that edge, and then just walk it out so that you have asphaltum all over that white. Tones it down, softens it. And then you want to walk that shadow out, just like that. Beautiful. Awesome. Now we want to do the same thing on the other side on that straight edge, like so. We'll give that a second to dry. Now the highlight is really simple on this. It's, I'm just using one of my Mezzalunas, which is a, a dry, nice dry brush from Dynasty. And it's a dry brushed highlight and it's almost centered, almost. So it's going to run right here and at a slight curve. So it would kind of do this. And it's just a light dry brush of warm white. I'm going to show you on the original. So you can see that it's, in a almost straight up and down slight curve but it's right here the brightest point is right on this upper portion of the vase so right in here and then that same dry brush you just dry brush the white over top of the black on the neck for a nice highlight up here so it's quite simple take your favorite dry brush whether it's a dome blender or it's a mezzaluna or a crescent brush, whatever your favorite is, load it up with some warm white. And this is how I do mine. 
I just pull it along in layers like this in the shape of the neck. And the same with the back of the neck. It gets a highlight as well, but always in the shape, following the shape of the neck of, of that boss. Just like that. And it gets a little bit brighter as, as you go over it. When you find you've run out of paint, just pick up a little bit more. So nice dry brush shape, putting that in. Oops. I got a little too much white on that. So I'm just going to pull it across the top here to give me that nice shape. This is almost dry, so I can start putting some highlight in here. almost out of paint again. So I'm going to load it up. There we go. You always have to remember that this vase is round. It's got a curve on it. So the highlight also has to have a curve because that's how the light hits it. It follows that shape. So I'm coming down like that. But always thinking about where that brightest point is on that vase. We don't want the, the highlight on here to get so bright that it buries all of that texture back there, that pattern that's in the stencil. There we go. So it's just a dry brush. I'm just laying color in. I'm not really following any one shape. It's sort of cross-hatched. I'm just making sure that that brightest highlight stays where that light impact point would be, which is right here. And don't forget about that part up here. And look at that boss. So I'm going to put a nice bright highlight on the neck but it needs to go in two places because it's back here. Probably too bright, but, and here. Now, there is a little spot in this one that I want to fix. And it's just this little shadow on the inside of the vase right here. I find it got a little bit lost, so I'm just going to clean up that line with a float of that carbon black. Now I'm floating it so that it goes over that white that's on the back of the neck, and that will actually soften that black a little, and it'll give you a nicer look in the end. So now we have a nice deep one, and I'm going to shade right over top of that stem that's coming out of that vase, like so. There we go. I'm just going to touch up a few shadows, make them a little darker where I want them darker. There we go. You can do the same thing if at any time you feel that the flowers aren't showing up nicely against that background. There's nothing that says you can't take a little bit of that carbon black and crisp up some of those shadows, those edges of the flowers. It will give you a nice lift. It will give the flowers a nice crisp edge and that shadow will push those that background back a little bit and it brings the flowers forward. I try to keep that shading for the end simply because it's that last little bit that's going to give you the oomph. 
it's also where you can fix a lot of little odds and sods, shadows. You, know, you can tweak all of your shadows in and around, but that little bit of black, that float going in and around your flowers will give you lots of bang for your buck. It just adds a little more depth and it doesn't have to be a strong shadow. You don't need a really hard-edged float. It's just enough to set that lettering back just a little bit and it gives their flowers that nice crisp clean edge. Black backgrounds are great for drama. If you want to create drama in something, a black background is always a great idea. I love working on black, but not just plain black. I love the idea of having soft visual textures in the background, like we created with the paper towel and the wet glaze. Having these various lettering set back, if they're indistinct and imperfect, it creates the illusion that they're even further away than this lettering that you brushed in. Again, talking about getting it imperfect, when you sand this back after you've done your lettering and the texture of the, the wood surface or the canvas comes through, it also softens this and creates a little more distance. Then when you put the glaze over top, it goes back even further. So everything that you've painted after the background jumps forward and it creates a lot of visual in interest in your finished piece. So even the simplest design takes on a completely different look just by changing up the background. These orchids would have been pretty on a plain black background. They would have been pretty on a pain beige or a tan or even a red background. But having all of these other things in there creates more interest and more drama and makes the flowers even more special. So I'm going to take a little of that green gold and a little bit of warm white and I'm going to put in a few little tendrils that are just a brighter green. Not perfect. I'm not looking for perfection. I just want a little softness in this. I'm going to take that same color and finish off this little vine here that overlaps our vase just to keep it interesting and then I have one more thing I really like doing with some of these it just makes things more interesting and you'll notice that there's a vine in the background in this piece what I did was I took this is an oil a deco color it's an oil gold pen it's an oil base and I just follow some of those vines and tendrils with this. It's like a marker. Works really well and it's simple, but it adds a little shimmer and a little bit of interest to the background. And it just, it's pretty. Who doesn't like a little bit of bling? And it ties the gold that was in that initial stencil to the finished piece as well. So we've just got one more step for this piece and that is to spatter it. We're just going to pick up my uh, my favorite ugly brush. I know, remember, the fugly brush. And I'm going to start with a little bit of uh, warm white, and I'm going to thin it out with a little bit of glaze. I don't want it too thin, but, and I'm going to spatter my surface just lightly. I don't want a heavy spatter, but just a little bit on this surface with the warm white and then I'm going to rinse and I'm going to do the same thing again but I'm going to do it with ashfaltum. You can do it with the carbon black too but I like the ashfaltum it's softer. The black tends to be a little harsh especially on white flowers it would stand out a bit too much. So here I go with a soft spatter of the ashfaltum like so. Give this a few minutes to dry, and then you can take um, your favorite angled shader, and you can take your carbon black and go around the outside edges. You can do it with a stamp pad, 
uh, by rubbing the stamp pad on the edges, but I like it with just the paint, it's softer. So we're going to take a nice angled shader and a little bit of that fast drying glaze, a good wet brush, and some carbon black. And it's straight up carbon black. It's going to be very strong. And I'm going to float the edges. And wherever the flowers are, I'm going to stop. So just a float of that carbon black on the outside edge. You can make it a little wider in the corners. You notice it's a very neat and tidy float. <laughs> Not so much. Walk it out a little in the corners. What that'll do is that you'll have a darker edge and it will soften the effect of some of those stencils and that the other pattern in the background. Makes them just a little less distinct. There. I'm kind of liking it on the vase too. So I'm going to put a little on the vase. There. You can deepen this shadow if you like around the vase. I like that. Just gives it a little more dimension. And that, as they say, is that. So that is a fun background for pretty white orchids. You can take your um, Uniball gel pen. I really love doing this. I just sort of put a light scribbly line on my flowers. I it just, it softens the look, softens the edges and just makes it look a little more casual and a little yes less structured and it's a, it gives it a pretty effect so that is it a great fun background to do with stamps with stencils with brush lettering some stenciling for the vase a simple technique for painting these flowers and an easy way to finish them up just using a gel pen guys this was a lot of fun I enjoyed doing this immensely. It was fun getting it ready. And I'm so glad that you came to join me today. Don't forget, like and share the video because we have some great giveaways um, from Stampendous. We have two gorgeous stamp sets to give away. This is a beautiful paisley, which by the way, makes an amazing background. And this gorgeous set of Dynasty Faux Squirrel rounds. These are the jumbo rounds. So. I, somebody's going away with a gorgeous set so like and share the video oh i'm there i'm back again <laughs> i forgot where the camera was um like and share the video come and uh, join me again next saturday i'm going to come up with something fun and unique and i'm thinking it's going to be mixed media we'll play with a little bit of mixed media on saturday so like and share the video have some fun with this pattern. The pattern is available on the website. You can find it at uh, tracymoreau.net. We also have the stencils in stock, which is the background, Baroque background and the postage stencil. Those are both available on the website. Uh, what else? I think that's about it. Thanks for joining me today. It's always a blast to see everybody here and I'll see you again next week. Bye.